Open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of John and chapter number 20. <clears throat> the Gospel record of John at chapter 20, verses 1 through verse number 10. I'm grateful for all of the members who are visiting with us this morning. <laughs> Praise the Lord for your presence. You are welcome to join us every time our church doors are open. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen, linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Verse 10 reads, then the disciples returned to their homes. Thank you, you may be seated. The grass withers and the flower thereof fadeth away, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I want to talk to us today from this subject. The word is out that the word is out. The word is out that the word is is out. John says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, but this morning, the word is out. That the word is out. I recently read New York Times best-selling author and MSNBC host Joy Reid's extraordinary book entitled Medgar and Murley. Medgar Evers and the love story that awakened America. Murley Louise Beasley met Medgar Evers on her first day of college at what is now Alcorn State University. It was love at first sight. And they were married a year later. Medgar became the field secretary for the Mississippi branch of the NAACP with all of the attendant dangers which with that position was fraught. On June 12th, 
1963, one month before he turned 38 years old, he was gunned down in the driveway of his home that he shared with his wife and three children. Medgar Evers was violently cut down, shot in the back by the virulent, racist clansman Byron De La Beckwith. And after two trials in Mississippi with a hung jury, De La Beckwith went free with no conviction. But with advances in the forensic sciences unavailable at the time, in the 1990s, his body was exhumed from his internment at Arlington National Cemetery. And a conviction came at the trial, and De La Beckwith died in a prison hospital. Merle nor her two older children were present at the exhumation. But her youngest son, their youngest son, Van, who was only three years old when his father was assassinated, wanted to be at the exhumation. And when they opened Medgar's casket that had been sealed for 30 years, when they opened the casket, inside Medgar's body was remarkably preserved. The famed forensic pathologist, Dr. Michael Baden, said it was as though Medgar had remained intact long enough for his youngest child to see and visit him and get to know him. But one Sunday morning, there was another time when another grave was open. Not by the will of the district attorney in Mississippi, but by the will of God himself. This grave was not in Arlington, Virginia, but in a garden tomb in Jerusalem. This was not an exhumation, but a resurrection. Because in Arlington National Cemetery, Medgar Evers' body was perfectly preserved in the clothes that he was buried in. But at the tomb in Jerusalem, those who looked in the tomb saw the body that Jesus was wrapped in, but his body wasn't there. Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen as he said. Come. See the place where the Lord was laid. I serve a risen Savior. I wish I had somebody to help me preach. He's in the world today. I know that he's living. Whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. Hey, he walks with me, he talks with me. Along life's narrow way, he lives, he lives, salvation to him. You ask me how I know he lives. Hey! He lives in my heart. Come on, tell somebody. He lives 
in my heart. That's why I shout so much. If I'm singing too loud, you ought to go sit somewhere else. If I'm praising too much, find you another section. I'm here this morning because he lives. I don't worship a dead Jesus. I worship a living Savior. Uh, hear me, beloved. Hmm. The only evidence, the only evidence that he had ever been in the tomb was the presence of his grave clothes. Because the Lord Jesus Christ had risen from the grave and simply walked out of the tomb. The resurrection is the foundation of the Christian faith. If Christ is not risen from the dead, we have no Christianity. No Christian faith, no Christian hope, no Christian church in any sense of the word for then without the resurrection we have no Christ, no Redeemer, no Savior, and no Lord. Paul said in 1 Corinthians at chapter 15 verse number 19, if in this life only we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. Yes. Yet the Canadian preacher and theologian A.B. Simpson reminds us that Easter is the New Year's Day of the soul. Can I run that by you one more time? Easter is the New Year's Day of the soul. It was fitting, beloved, that he who was to scatter the darkness of the grave should rise while it was still dark. The darkness that had for so long overcome the world and had tried to do the same to the Son of Man was here taking its last breath before the sun, S-O-N, the light of the world, came to life again and got his victory over death on that first Easter day. The appearance of our Lord to Mary Magdalene give the dawning of faith before sight and the rapturous faith that is born of sight. The great Christian writer Philip Yancey once said that faith is best defined as believing in advance in something that will only make sense when you see it in reverse. Faith is believing in advance something that will only make sense when you see it in reverse. Um, it's something like um, the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. Before they got thrown in, the king said, I'm going to give you one more chance. When you hear the music, bow and worship the golden image or else you will be thrown immediately into the burning fiery furnace. They did not know how or if at all God was going to respond. But faith is believing in advance in something that can only be making sense 
when you see it in reverse. They said, oh king, we are not careful to answer you in this matter because the God we serve is able and he will deliver us out of your hand. But if not, we are still not going to buy. I wish I had somebody to help me preach. You ought to trust God so much that you ought to start shouting before you get the answer. You ought to start praising before God opens the door. You ought to give him glory before God dries the tear. You ought to give God a hallelujah before you get the victory. Because faith is believing in advance what only makes sense in reverse. Uh, Jesus has completed the mission He's completed the mission from his father and he has, he has inaugurated the new creation with the empty tomb declaring that death itself has been defeated. Paul puts it like this. Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory. I wish I had a Bible reader through our Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, you can say it with me. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And this morning when you leave here, you can tell everybody you meet that the word is out. Um, I want you to see something here. It's a peaceful word. In verses five, six, and seven. Look with me at verses five, six, and seven. He, he bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, following John, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up, folded in a place by itself. It's a peaceful word. After Jesus died on the cross, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took his body down, prepared it for burial, Along with the women, they, they wrapped him in linen cloths with 100 pounds of perfume and spices. And they placed his perfumed, anointed body in Joseph's new tomb. The Jewish leaders asked Pilate to seal the tomb and place soldiers around it to keep them from body snatching. All night Friday? All day Saturday? For a night. But joy comes in the morning Somehow between before day in the morning and when the sun came up, S-U-N, the sun, S-O-N, got up from the grave. I, I want you to, I want, and run out. Because 
Kings don't run. Power can take his time. When you know who you are and whose you are, you don't have to get in a hurry. Can I make that make sense? There's no trace of hurry. There is no struggle in the tomb. He did not go out with haste deliberately in the majesty of his lordship over death. He rose from slumber He didn't leave his bed unmade. He got up and made his bed and walked out of the tomb. Because when you the man, when you Jesus, ain't nobody chasing you out the grave because you went in the grave by your own power. Pilate said, do you know who I am? I can take your life whenever I get ready. Jesus said, no man takes my life. I lay it down. Have I got a witness? And if I lay it down, I can pick it up again. And I, if I be lifted up, am I doing all right? He got up, made his bed, and Mary Magdalene and the other women, according to the synoptics and John, they are wondering who will roll the stone away. But when they get there, the stone has been rolled away not to let Jesus out but to let the witnesses in hmm. Mary Magdalene who was perhaps younger than the other women ran to find Peter and John and with excitement and exasperation and desperation and anxiety, she said, they have taken my Lord away and we don't know where they've laid him. Peter and John get up and John outruns Peter, not because he loves Jesus more, he runs to the tomb, but John looks in and he sees at first intellectually that the tomb is empty but Peter goes all the way in the tomb he goes right up to the spot where Jesus was laid and he sees the linen cloth and the napkin that was used to keep his mouth closed stay with me in the tomb is a remarkable sight. The linen bands lying holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, completely undisturbed. In the proper place with the body of Jesus gone out of them, they are left in the shape of his body. It is like a butterfly has come out of its cocoon. And when they wound his body and his limbs, but he is no longer in the linen wrap. Was put around his head, is neatly folded in another spot. Now, to me, the linen... But Jesus takes an extra step. He folds 
the napkin and puts it in another because the book of Deuteronomy says in the mouth of two witnesses of transfiguration it was two witnesses Moses and the linen cloth and the linen napkin are there as two witnesses to declare I'm, 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 I'm spending too much time right there, but, but, but let me take another second or two to, to, to press this a little further. Um, the linen napkin is preaching to us. When you go to a restaurant, uh, And, and you finish with your meal. You, 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 you crumple your napkin up and, and put it on the plate so that if you should leave to go to the restroom or go make a phone call, your server knows if I'm not at the table, take it away. But if you're coming back, You fold your napkin, leave it on the table, and tell the server, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. Because in my father's house, I wish I had a Bible reader, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm coming back to receive you unto myself that where I am, hey, there you may be also. That's a, that's a that's a peaceful word but it's also a powerful word because the fact that Jesus lives God accepted the death of Jesus on the cross as payment for my sin debt. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Though your sin be as scarlet, it can be white as snow. Though it be red like crimson, he can make it look like wool. And he washes it, not with Dawn dishwashing liquid. Not with tired washing powder. But he washes it with his blood so that the stain will never come back again. And when I sin and the devil accuses me before the Father, Jesus stands up at the right hand with power and said, I know he's wrong, but I paid for that on the cross. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there I wish I had a witness it was there by faith I received my sight and I'm happy not just on Easter Sunday not just at Lily Grove but I'm happy in my car. I'm happy in my living room. I'm happy sitting in the garage. I'm 
happy in the line at H-E-B. I'm happy everywhere, every day, every day, every minute, every hour. I'm excited. I, I want to I want to share a word with you here who don't know how to praise God. If there's any day you ought to shout, it's Easter Sunday morning. Because God can give you a brand new start. God can give you a fresh new beginning. God can wipe away all the mess that's been in your life 40, 50 years. God can make your life brand new. God can give you a new opportunity to get it right. God can set joy bells ringing in your soul and your past will never catch up with you and your future is always before you because every saint in here got a past but every sinner in here has a future because Jesus died on the cross to save you from your sin. I'm through. I'm through. It's a peaceful word. It's a powerful word. It's a promising word. But lastly, it's a personal word. He saved me. If I had been the only person alive on the planet, Jesus would have died just for me. I, I, I think I ought, to, I ought to quit here. Uh, Mrs. Anderson has made some reservations at an expensive restaurant today. I think I ought to quit here. I ain't got time to play with y'all all day. <laughs> but people go to cemeteries, sleeping places, because the person they knew or loved is still there. In Arlington National Cemetery, there's not only the tomb of the unknown soldier, but Medgar Evers is buried there. John Kennedy and Jacqueline Kennedy and John Jr. are buried at Arlington Cemetery. And people come from all over the world to visit that cemetery because those famed people are still there. Mount Vernon. George Washington's body is still there. Loma Linda in California where the Nixon Library rests. Richard and Pat Nixon are still there. On the campus of Texas A&M, the body of George Herbert Walker Bush and Barbara Pierce Bush can be visited even today because they are still there. People go to Atlanta, Georgia to the King Center because Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta King are still there. People go all the way to London to Westminster Abbey because underneath the floor of that abbey is a crypt where St. John of Don is buried. King Edward the Confessor is buried. King Henry the Eighth is buried. Their bodies are still in the crypt at Westminster Abbey. Every time I go to Eunice where I'm from, 
I go to Honey Bee Cemetery because my mother is still there. My father is still there. Four of my brothers are still there. Every time we bury somebody at Paradise North or Houston Memorial Garden, I walk around in that cemetery and see members of Lily Grove that used to be here, but now they are there. But there is a tomb in Jerusalem that people visit not because he's still there, but people still go to a tomb in Jerusalem because he is not there. And the reason why we get dressed on Sunday morning is because Jesus is a risen Savior. The reason why we come from our various homes to lift our hands in the sanctuary is because he's not dead, he's still alive. If the Lord is alive in your life, if the Lord opened doors for you, if the Lord made a way for you, if the Lord forgave your sin, gave you a brand new start, and you don't mind testifying, if he answered your prayers, dried your tears, made your enemy your footstool, put food on your table, clothes on your back, money in your pocket, and you're not too mean to testify. If he healed you, if he saved you, if he forgave you, if he put you on your feet again, if he picked you up, turn you around, place your feet on solid ground. Now is the time, this is the place to tell God thank you. He's alive, he's alive. The reason why I know he's alive, I talked with him this morning. Jesus is on the main line. Jesus is on the main line. Jesus is on the main line. Tell him what you want. If you're sick and you can't get well, tell him what you want. If you sin and you need to be forgiven, tell him what you want. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Why don't you grab somebody, shake somebody's hand, tell them whatever you're going through, whatever you are up against, whatever the devil has thrown in your path, God will, 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 God will. won't he do it? Won't he turn it around? Won't he make a way? Say yeah! 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 I know he's alright! Won't he make a way? Tell him thank you. Thank you that you
you got up. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for the empty tomb. Thank you that you're coming back.